we like to start with good news. And we start off just with simple good news of climate actions that President Biden took on day one. Thank you, Kelly, for pulling together this slide. Rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, revoking the Keystone XL oil pipelines federal permit, pledging to review a laundry list of Trump administration regulatory actions aimed at propping up high mitting industries. So I thought to myself, I've read about more good things he's done since day one. Maybe I should add to this slide. Then I thought, why should I do all that work? Let's crowdsource it. <laughs> when people put in the chat other good news that they want to share that's happened since January 20th on environmental issues. And actually, I'm not sure I can see the chat and share my screen at the same time. So, um, Kelly or Marion, can you see things in the chat and read them out to people who don't have access to chat? Okay, someone said, pledge to make the entire government fleet electric vehicles. A complete and wholehearted embrace of science and evidence-based decision-making across the new administration. He nominated Deb Holland for Interior Department head. 30% of land and water preserved by 2030. Considering a, a creation of a federal office of environmental justice, making climate action plan of everything the government does. Oh, I did that one. Um, considering formation of a civilian climate corps, mandating mask wearing in federal government. I think that's the ones at the top. No, Gina McCarthy, McCarthy, the domestic climate policy advisor. She's great. Yeah, I guess I could have, I mean, sometimes people say, let's take off, take yourself off mute and everyone give a cheer. Why don't we do that? Take yourself off mute and express how you feel about those actions taking yeah. place. Yeah. 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 All right. There's one more okay. that I heard. I'm sorry, this is Tom McClintock. Um, I thought that Biden passed an executive order that uh, eliminated oil and gas leases on federal property or something close to that. Yes. Yep. Eliminating, uh, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for that. So now, just to ground ourselves before we um, launch into our, our great speaker. I invite you to make sure your feet are on the ground and you can look at this picture taken here um, in the broader um, Dane County area. Oops. Come um, here. Mike, want to help mute people. Okay. Um, so. As we look at this, let's take two deep breaths together. So as we look at the trees on this land, may we honor the people who lived on this land. Some of them at the time of the trees, long before the white settlers. In particular, I wanna pay respects to the Ho-Chunk people who lived on this land for thousands of years and were forced to leave the land in 1832. They were moved to reservations in other states, but many of them walked back to their homes here. Now I'd like to give a quick preview of the evening. Since we're a very volunteer run organization, it also helps people besides me know when they're up. Uh, um, in a minute, I'll turn this over to Gail Nordheim, who will introduce our speaker, Maria Redmond, who's gonna to speak to us about Wisconsin's climate and clean energy future. 
after her presentation, we'll have time for Q&A and you know, we'll see how much, how active the Q&A is and then we'll shift to sharing some exciting 350 Madison updates. And we'll take an action together where we do something very simple digitally so we can not just be listening but acting at the same time. And then near the end of the evening, I'll explain how you have options for going to different breakout rooms. That's our preview. Oh, actually, I'm going to stop sharing. And um, yay, uh, Maria is going to share her slides. Um, but Gail, I know you want to introduce Maria. Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you, Julia. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Maria Redman. Maria is the director of the Wisconsin Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy. She was responsible for coordinating the work of the governor's climate change task force, which received input from people across Wisconsin. As you may recall, 350 Madison submitted a comment letter to the task force and many of our members attended the listening sessions and provided important feedback. A number of our concerns are reflected in the re recently published task force report. The report covers a broad array of important recommendations to move Wisconsin forward on climate change and outlines best strategies for tackling the climate crisis across nine sectors. Maria will provide an overview of the report and offer guidance on how we can help ensure that task force strategies are implemented. Maria has worked for the state of Wisconsin for 20 years and is accountable for planning, administration and oversight of statewide energy programs and regulatory policies. She has significant experience in directing federally funded grant and loan programs and ratepayer energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. In addition to helping with the implementation of the recommendations outlined in the task force report, Maria is leading the development of a comprehensive statewide clean energy plan. The plan is centered on environmental justice and will create a pathway to multi-sector deep decarbonization and a bustling clean energy economy that supports a diverse work, workforce and technology innovation. So uh, it's my pleasure to um, turn it over to Maria. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And I, I love the energy in this group. I wanna come attend these meetings every month because I just feel connected. It's awesome. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am just happy to be here and to talk about the administration's climate and clean energy goals. And um, I do want this to be somewhat of a discussion too. I don't want to just talk at you. So if there is an opportunity to interject with questions, like certainly would welcome that because um, I like to answer questions like right when someone has a thought, but, um, and I limited the slides so we could have some more uh, discussion. So I don't know that I can see the chat. So if someone else can um, chime in, if there's a question, feel free to interrupt me at any time, if that's okay. Does that work, Gail? Uh, sure, I could, if a question comes into the chat, I okay. could, I, I don't want to interrupt you every minute, but I'll maybe <laughs> save up a little block of them and then we could do yeah, I'll do, what I'll do is I'll just pause and say, are there any questions or anything that, like that, that um, along good. the way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just to jump right in, um, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Wisconsin Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy, I was uh, asked to come to this position uh, by the Lieutenant Governor and Governor uh, of J January of last year. So I've been in the position for a year. And as many of you are aware by, my interactions with you and probably seeing me at a lot of the climate task force meetings. Um, that was a lot of my time last year is how was helping the uh, governor's task force on climate change, pull together recommendations and get a list of recommendations together uh, to present to the governor by the deadline of October 31st. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the work that I'm, I'm really focused on now is launching the clean energy planning process that was mentioned 
uh, really increasing our stakeholder engagement, making sure that we're we're not just working in a silo and, and what we think we need to do. Um, what what we want to do is we want to help. Um, you know, I didn't, we're the government. We're here to help. Uh, <laughs> we want to make that a reality. Um, and I'm super excited. I pinch myself every day to be able to do the work that I do and to be able to like really make change and, and try to figure out what can we do through state programs and state efforts and policy development to really move the needle. Um, I have worked in this space for 20 years and it's just exciting to have a champion and have the um, now not only the state support but the federal support as well and, and trying to figure out like how do we organize this and how do we all work collaboratively. Um, not everybody's going to be satisfied with the decisions that we make and how we how we move forward, but how do we find a place where we can get the most consensus um, to be able to to um, really transition to a clean energy economy and and really reduce our emissions and help help our citizens in the state and and help uh, globally like we have a we play a part in a global effort on on this work. So I spend a lot of time working with the Lieutenant Governor uh, Mandela Barnes on his work uh, to mitigate and adapt to and create policy and movement around climate change. And he's involved with a lot of work globally. And so um, just trying to help move things along. And another thing is that we are engaging our state agencies. And so this Thursday, for example, I'm meeting with the assistant deputy secretaries across all the agencies in the state to talk about the implementation of, of the climate task force recommendations, as well as developing the clean energy plan and making sure that any policies or strategies we develop in the plan that the state agencies are a part of that effort as well. So that we're not just saying, hey, we want to change building codes. I know this group is very interested in, in the transition and updating of building codes, but we're not just saying that that needs to happen, that we have Department of Safety Professional Services involved in the process to ensure that we're, again, working collaboratively. Um, any any strategy has an agency. And it's uh, what's interesting about energy and climate is it, it goes across all agencies. And so we want to have that engagement. So I've been really working hard to ensure that we have leadership, uh, the state secretaries across all agencies involved, and then not only to have them involved, but also to have them assign technical folks so that we can get data, we can make data driven decisions, and we can um, have some analysis analysis done on some of the strategies that we're looking at moving forward with. So um, that's a lot of what my role is right now. I'm an office of, of one and a half. Uh, we have a couple of LTEs that are working with us and I have been really trying to get creative on how to um, get some more help and um, I have been working with the university with some interns and, and trying to map out what we're going to do for the state. So I'm super excited about it and super excited at these opportunities um, to come in front of groups and, and have discussions and, and get some feedback. And I will lay out the fact that I don't know everything. <laughs> I will openly admit that I don't know everything and I have a lot to learn about the world and, and what's happening. And, and my, my goal is to facilitate collaboration, to connect the dots, to put the pieces together so that we can have a cohesive path moving forward. So many of you are aware that, uh, and some of you might be new to this, so I just wanted to share that the um, governor issued an executive order number 38, which created the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy and also created this position that I'm in, but also directed the state to uh, to move towards 100% carbon free electricity by 2050. Um, we're slowly but surely recognizing that that's not actually fast enough that any policy that we start to put together now needs to be faster. So that's one of the things that we've been looking at or what are the opportunities, especially with some of the most recent announcements is that we're not, this 100% this carbon free electricity consumed by 2050 goal might be a little bit behind and that we might be 
we want to start looking at something that's more aggressive and more assertive so that as part of our clean energy planning process, we're looking at those pockets of opportunity to identify how quickly we can move um, in that in the direction of a carbon free, uh, carbon free electricity, but also looking across um, multi sectors and so looking at transportation buildings industrial uh, agriculture and looking at all the opportunities that we have to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions across across those sectors. We also have um, the clean energy workforce training and innovation research and business development and then state lead by example. So one thing we can tell the this tell you all in the state what what we think you should do, but if we're not practicing what we preach, we, you know, people aren't really going to take it seriously. So, and we can as a state lead by example and show um, some best practices and, and models and create opportunities for local governments and businesses um, by setting the example. So we've been doing a lot of um, analysis and, and figuring out where the data is at and what, what we do as a state, as state agencies and figuring out how do we, we move forward with climate uh, initiatives and, and greenhouse gas emission reductions? How do we look at how our programs are run and address environmental justice, um, looking at energy, water, waste, all uh, procurement, sustainable um, procurement, supplier diversity, everything that we're doing as a state um, to, to lead by example. Shortly after the executive order 38, the governor issued executive order 52 relating to the creation of the governor's task force on climate change. And um, a lot of my presentation today is related to that and, and a lot of the interest that in, in the initial discussions on this presentation um, is there's a lot of interest in those climate solutions that came out of that process. So I wanted to talk a bit about the process. Um, really it's coming up with strategies to adapt to and mitigate climate change here in Wisconsin and really focusing in on what specifically Wisconsin can do to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help reduce the temperature and, and really lean on, on science and, and data and to try to figure out how are we going to do this and looking across, again, looking across the agencies and the different programs that we have across different sectors, um, looking for all those opportunities to be able to, to um, address climate change here in the state specifically. So our guiding principles here for the task force, um, hold on one second, I gotta close this, okay. <laughs> So our guiding principles for the task force are really to fulfill our mission, to make meaningful recommendations, to reduce emissions, our vision to reduce emissions, well, and the specific goal is 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050, but again, looking across multiple sectors to see where we have the opportunity to reduce emissions, centering on environmental justice, understanding that um, there are people in the state and communities in the state that are disproportionately uh, affected by climate change, affected by energy burden um, more than others. And so recognizing that and elevating the importance of addressing that. Empowering community voice. One of the things that we were super proud of in this process was the fact that um, while there was a pandemic, I think it opened up a lot of, the silver lining of it is it opened up a lot of opportunity for us to be able to reach out to all areas of the state and have our listening sessions to be able to, to bring over a thousand people um, to, to, to talk about climate change and what it means to them. And then not only listen, but take into consideration and try to incorporate some of those thoughts into those recommendations. And so that that is one, one thing that I'll talk about a little bit more later um, as it relates to kind of how the climate solutions were um, laid out. And then factoring public and political will, you know, we all recognize that we have a unique uh, political structure here in the state with a legislature and a, a administration that kind of sometimes work against each other. And so recognizing that and, and factoring in like, what can we do without any legislation or what can we do with agency action or what can we do with the budget and, and making sure that we have, again, a, a wide, diverse variety of people at the table that represent uh, lots of different uh, perspectives. So making sure that we factor that in as well. Diversity and implementation, like I said, legislation, budget, 
agency action? Like what are the different mechanisms to actually reach our goals and how do we, we deploy these, these climate solutions? And then again, upholding the values of this administration and, and making sure that we focus on equi equity and sustainability um, throughout the, the recommendations. Um, I think a couple of, I can just pause here. Um, it looks like um, a couple of questions came in. They look like they're pretty specific though. Um, um, yeah, there's been, well, there's been some back and forth about what is really meant by being carbon free, mm -hmm. um, going beyond just electrification. And then we had um, a question would you give us a concrete example of how the state will lead on reducing CO2 and how can we help? Yeah, so one thing that we, through the clean energy planning process, we, are, uh, we have a number of strategies that we're looking at across multiple sectors. And so one thing that we're looking at is electrification um, in industry, in in buildings and um, we recognize that electrification is a, a really good way to get to carbon free, um, but there's a lot that we have to do related to that to ensure that you know how we get to electrification and how we electrify buildings and electrify transportation. Um, the way that we do that is, is just and fair. And so um, we, we can talk a bit more about, like as I go through, we can talk a bit more about um, how you can help. I think one thing, what we would like to do is we'd like to get our, our strategies in place and we would like to share those strategies with you so you could take a look at them. And, and once we publish our clean energy plan, we would like help to you know advocate for some of the you know, I think the goal is to decide if we want to have like a legislative package or we want the agencies to take the lead, but, you know, help with um, deploying and support for the strategies that, that are in place. So, you know, we're still developing a lot of that. Um, when it comes to the climate task force, those recommendations are already in place and we're a little ahead of of the game here because we're waiting for the governor's budget to come out. I think once the governor's budget comes out, um, that's going to be a driver towards like what the governor um, is has pulled out of the task force recommendations and what climate solutions he would like to support through the budget process. And that's going to be a great opportunity for you to talk to your legislator and talk to them about what's important as part of that budget and what they should be supporting. So there's that that avenue as well to, to advocate on that level. Um, I, I don't know, are you, you are a non-lobbying organization, correct? That, correct. We're, we're uh, C3, so we're, we're nonpartisan. Yeah. And our ability to lobby is restricted. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to lobby, but you certainly want to educate, right? So you want to, you know, take, um, I think, take what the go the governor, and I don't know what the final say is, and that's going to happen on, and we'll, I'll talk about this soon. Um, February 16th is the governor's budget address, and we'll see um, once the budget is released what what's in there. Um, but there's certainly opportunity to, um, talk to legislators about what's important in the budget, but then also talk to them about what's not included in the budget. Um, Cause they're, you know, not everything can be included in the budget. So I think it's um, trying to ensure that legislators are educated on why this is important, the impacts of deploying some of these recommendations and, and what it means to communities. So, you know, I think that's sort of, that's something that I mean, I I talk to the led I talk to legislators and we give them information from a state perspective, but certainly from the community perspective, it's important to, for them to hear your voice as well. We're, we're getting a lot of questions, but I think it might be best if you continue because I think some of them anticipate what you're probably planning to say. So. Yeah. So yeah, I think this this is awesome. I love the questions, and then I'll also be going into a breakout room too. So if I'm not able to answer everything, certainly can do that. 
Um, but yeah, let me scoot through these slides. I think it's great that we're getting so many questions. Um, let's see here. Oh, yikes. Okay, timeline. So just quickly through the timeline, uh, a lot of you probably followed this, but for those of you who are new to the, the task force on climate change, uh, October of 2019, the executive order came out and established the task force. We ha had our first meeting here in December in Madison, and we focused on the science and had Wiki uh, present as well as environmental justice and had, um, um, oh no, my brain is not working right now. Um, August Fall from... <laughs> Cream City Conservation. And uh, she's an expert in environmental justice and racial justice. And if you ever get a chance, I think if you are looking for speakers um, on this in this area, she's great. If you have not had her, like I would uh, heard her speak or had gone through one of her trainings, it's it's really, really important. Um, and it is also um, uh, very worthwhile. So I would highly recommend uh, her presentation or having her come to one of your meetings if she hasn't already. And then, oh, sorry. Then we had a member meeting in March uh, featuring energy, housing, and infrastructure. And then we had subcommittee meetings. So we right away recognized that we needed to kind of categorize some of the work. So we had a uh, subcommittee on energy, housing, and infrastructure. We had a subcommittee on land use and conservation, and one more on a healthy and um, healthy economy. And that was focused on health and economy. So the subcommittees met April through July, and then we had another meeting, uh, member meeting that was focused on agriculture and forestry. And just so you all are aware, if you uh, um, haven't been to climate, climatechange.wi.gov, that's where all of the meetings are posted. And there's a lot of information on all of the meetings and the presentations at, from each one of those meetings. So um, if you want to take a look at those, they're, they're available at climatechange.wi.gov. And we held a number of virtual public listening sessions, as well as subcommittees in June and July of 2020. And then we just kind of work through the a list of recommendations that were put together by all of the subcommittees. And I think when we compiled everything, there is about 125 to 150 recommendations that's that we started out with. And we basically kind of combined and whittled them back. And then we took into consideration public input. Um, we had in, in this timeline, we, we tried to, you know, kind of bucket and categorize and kind of make it organized so that, you know, things kind of fell pretty organically into, into the climate change report. And so um, I was surprised at how neatly everything came together. Um, but, you know, now without some, some back and forth on, on some of the recommendations. So we were able to get to a final report we were able to get to delivery of the, uh, our final list of recommendations, sorry. And we were able to deliver those October 31st to the governor. At that point, the governor and, and the staff and the state budget office started looking at implementation. So um, while they were, they were doing that, we were, uh, other staff was working on actually putting together the, the final report that was published in December. And so that took a little bit of time to get that pulled together. And then uh, this February, in a, in a week and a half or so, the governor is going to give his budget address and we'll see um, at that point like what is included as part of his budget proposal. And the task force members want to have a check-in. So we are working on another task force meeting that will probably take place sometime in March after the budget address and, and our time getting some a little bit of time to kind of process what's in the budget and and to also be able to talk about what's not included in the budget. And the idea is to bring the members together so that we can talk about the implementation plan 
and talk about what what's included, what's not included, and also talk a bit about a little bit more about advocacy and, and what people can do from that point to move forward with uh, supporting the recommendations um, through the legislative process uh, and budget process or through agency action or however each recommendation um, is charted to move forward. But we don't want any recommendation left behind. Um, we want to make sure that we're moving forward with everything, and that again, it's an actionable plan that we're we're thinking about um, consistently. And so, I think that the task force member meetings will not end. I think that we'll continue to have them and have check-ins um, ongoing. Um, for now, our first one will likely be in March, and I'm certainly happy to share that information with you. Um, it will be a public meeting. So uh, I'm happy to share that information with this group once that meeting is scheduled. As it was mentioned in the uh, opening discussion, we did have climate solutions covering nine sectors listed here, as well as three policy pathways, agency actions, budget legislation, which I've mentioned a couple times. And then we had these tier two uh, options. There's nine policy options. And really what happened was some of the options were proposed late in the process. Um, some of the options we recognize were provided. Uh, we had a lot of public input, for example, on uh, divestment in fossil fuels. Um, we had uh, no more fossil fuels, like banning fossil fuels. We wanted to include those in the the recommendations, but we didn't have enough support um, across the task force um, to include them in the main um, recommendation climate solutions list. But that being said, we included them in there. So the I think the the thing here is that we recognize that the importance of the tier two recommendations, but we need more time to vet them out and to to create a path forward to be able to address those items, either because of the late late submittal or because there was not enough consensus across the task force members to, to move forward. Um, so that being said, there's a clean energy planning process that I'm working on. And so I'm looking at some of these tier two recommendations and figuring out if we can come up with a plan to address them in our clean energy plan. So I know that you guys had some questions on um, some specific um, recommendations and specific solutions. And so I just wanted to take a little bit of time and I don't know how I'm doing on time. So please stop me or, or you know, if we wanna move these into a breakout and discuss these in breakout, we can. Um, I'll take your direction, uh, folks who are running this meeting, but these are the, uh, these are the three items that were brought up as of great interest to your organization, updating state commercial and residential building energy codes, avoiding all new fossil fuel infrastructure and state divestment of fossil fuel stocks and other interests. Um, there was a recent announcement that UW actually is exploring the state divestment of, or the, the UW divestment of fossil fuel stocks, which I am super interested in, in seeing what they're doing and again, lining that up with what the state would be doing. But are there, I, do we have a little bit of time to talk about these? I would love to hear um, what some of the questions are specific related to that and see if I can answer them. And if not, we certainly can, uh, I can bring in the experts uh, outside of, of this call and, and bring people together and, and get some answers for you too, if, if, if I can't answer them. Yes, we do have some time for, um, and these are, you picked three <laughs> recommendations that I know people on different people on this call are very interested in. Yeah. So, I mean, do you want to ask questions? I, I mean, I could give you just a little background on each one of them, kind of like the state commercial and residential building codes um, were a part of the main recommendations um, and a part of the 55 solutions. The other two, uh, 47 and 48, were part of the tier two recommendations, partially because um, they were presented later. Uh, we didn't have enough information on them. I know that we all agree that the 
banning of fossil fuel. Um, infrastructure is, or avoiding all of fossil fuel infrastructure is a, definitely a solution to reducing our emissions here in the state. Um, there's a lot to that though, as we're looking at um, natural gas, uh, the utilities go to natural gas as, as the next step in carbon emission reductions. And so um, one of the things that we kept running into was affordability and reliability and being able to chart that path forward um, and actually do some analysis and technical analysis on what it means to avoid all new fossil fuel infrastructure and what it means to like, what are we replacing that infrastructure with renewables, um, distributed energy resources, and, and what does that look like? Um, I think we all can agree, and because it was in the, the task force report, that it's important, but we also all, all can agree that we need to do some more analysis on it and to chart that path forward before um, we make a, a statement as to like what does avoid all new fossil fuel infrastructure mean uh, for the state of Wisconsin specifically. And then the other question on divestment of fossil fuel stocks, um, uh, Representative Neubauer um, mentioned in the last meeting that we heard a lot of public input on this. And this is a very important topic that we've heard across all of the listening sessions. And so we recognize that this is another, you know, if we're if we're saying we need to move away from fossil fuels, why would we be, we be investing our dollars in fossil fuels? And the question came up is, is, well, how many of our investment opportunities are related to fossil fuels? Like we, we, we don't know. Um, so we can say that and maybe there's like one or two or maybe there's a hundred of them. So I think it was like, we wanted to know what that impact statement was so that we could get some more information and be able to say, okay, this is what it means for the state to divest from fossil fuel stocks. And these are the stocks associated with it and doing some more background and analysis on it before we um, officially came out and said, this is something that we're going to do. And, and that's part of, part of that discussion. Okay, and I'll stop talking because I do want some questions. So <laughs> I did say I wanted a discussion, so give it to me. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm scrolling through the questions um, now. Um, it's probably, okay, here's one. Um, it's probably too early to know specifics on how the Biden administration will impact climate policy and programs here, but does Governor Evers plan any specific requests or are there things he would like the Biden administration to do? Yeah, so the governor's office and lieutenant governor's office is working very closely with the um, administration and with those who are working closely with um, either through the US Climate Alliance or directly with the administration. I know they've had a couple of meetings already. Um, I have not been in, in, in those meetings, but I know that those discussions are happening. Um, we have, uh, through the US Climate Alliance work, um, I know that they met directly with Gina McCarthy um, a couple weeks ago to talk about uh, the state's work and, and the administration recognizes that over the last four years that the states have been carrying the weight on climate change work, um, especially those involved with the US Climate Alliance that have made commitments to um, address their portion of the, the Paris Climate Accord and, and their portion of emissions reductions. And so I think it's a lot of um, figuring out what the state's role is and what the states need and having that communication back and forth. I think, I think there's gonna be a, a significant amount of funding coming from the federal government for these efforts, but just a matter of um, what does each state need and where are they gonna direct it and what opportunities do we have? So we've been asked to kind of put together, um, start thinking about like the shovel ready projects and the, thing, and the things that we could get going right away. And so we're hoping that, you know, some of the work that we're doing related to the clean energy planning process and some of this, the task force recommendations kind of set that base of, of what we need here in the state, but certainly we need, we need some more organization and we need some more input on, on 
what we can do in Wisconsin. Um, but I know there's a ton of support coming and um, it's just a matter of um, keeping it organized. And I know the, the governor and Lieutenant Governor have been discussing um, with the administration um, what's best for Wisconsin. So, um, you know, I, the Lieutenant Governor is leading this, is a champion of this effort and is a very, um, is wel welcomes input. So I would not hesitate to, you know, reach out to his staff and, you know, give them your ideas. They're very open. Um, I work very closely with them and I'm, I'm more than willing to sit down and talk with a smaller group of you as well um, and, and get your thoughts and, and keep those in mind as we're having these discussions and moving forward. Um, so, you know, I just encourage you to, to keep providing input along the way and don't feel held back from providing uh, input through the various mechanisms, either through my office or directly to the Lieutenant Governor's office. Okay. Kind of related to that in terms of uh, perhaps a power imbalance, how do you balance the voices of industry and business with citizen voices in these environmental collaborations, given the huge difference in organization power and funding between the two? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think we, it's, it's understanding the perspective of where people are coming from and for industry and for manufacturing and for businesses, a lot of times it's that uh, return on investment, it's the initial cost, it's um, sometimes it's corporate sustainability that's driving, you know, what they're doing. Um, a lot with businesses, it's it's um, having a more of the economic discussion of savings, um, what, like how it can help and benefit their employees, things like that. So it's kind of like messaging and, and understanding that they're going to come at, business is going to come at it from a different perspective than communities or nonprofit organizations. And so it ha when you're like, when I'm in the space that I'm in, I have to be able to adjust to the audience and understand their perspective and where they're coming from, and then take that into consideration as we're moving forward. I had a conversation with some industrial folks uh, probably like a year ago. And as soon as I came into the room, as they're like, well, if it doesn't benefit our bottom line, we're not interested. Um, so we have to under, I have to understand that and understand that they're coming from a different perspective and talk about it in a different way. Um, maybe the fact that we're exporting $14 billion on our energy needs right now because we import a majority of our, our energy. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could at least be more efficient and keep our money here in the state and deploy renewables and distributed energy generation and have everybody be a part of that and keeping that money here in the state. And when you talk about efficiency and you talk about opportunities for growth and development and business and workforce and, and talk in that aspect, um, it's easier to have those discussions um, across the board. So I think it's just being flexible and listening to where people are coming from and then developing policy that benefits as many um, people and positions and perspectives as possible. Okay. Um, there's a question here, first of all, thanking you for, and, and the governor and Lieutenant governor for all the work you've done, but then especially appreciating uh, solution number 47, which is avoid all new fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, we hope that this solution will be included in the governor's biennial budget. And um, also asking if the governor has studied the problems that would be caused by a D DNR permit for Enbridge's proposed line five reroute. So that's definitely a DNR question. I know that DNR is working on this, and they work very closely closely with the with the governor's office. Um, I'm I'm not as close to this discussion. Um, I have been tracking it as as um, oh, 
I just lost the pen, sorry. <laughs> um, I've been tracking it closely and making sure, again, my major thing is with the clean energy plan, avoiding all new fossil fuel infrastructure, banning fossil fuel is actually one of the strategies that's in that. And so when we talk to, when we, like I said, we have the agencies involved with our discussion, like we have to factor in some of the things that are at play already. Um, and so we're talking um, closely with DNR to figure out like what's the, what's the path forward as they're dealing with Enbridge and they're dealing with, with that as, and how do we map out um, what that looks like in the clean energy plan? So I can't, I don't have a lot to offer you on that one because I'm not totally engaged. I'm observing and trying to figure out how does it sync up with our, our clean energy plan. And, and we also have, you know, it's, it's building, building natural gas um, facilities as bridge uh, fuels for um, reducing carbon emissions. Um, that's another one where, you know, we're talking with the utilities to figure out um, we understand some of these natural gas facilities are newer and they are, are there and are being built like, but ultimately we want to get those facilities to be carbon free. And so what is the, what do we need to do in innovation and technology like carbon capture and storage? Can we look to hydrogen as an option and thinking about that now? Um, that we need, that we're going to need to address that as part of our overall path forward. So it's sort of creating that pathway and understanding um, we need energy now, and this is how we get our energy now, but how do we move away from that in a way that um, takes into consideration energy burden, uh, deploying new technology, um, you know, as coal facilities close, like, there are assets that need to be addressed and, and who carries that burden. So there's a lot to it. And so um, DNR is the best one for the Enbridge um, Line 5. They're the ones that are working on that, but certainly I am communicating with them to make sure that our when we move forward, we're cohesive in addressing the issue at hand, and that's to avoid all new fossil fuel infrastructure. Julia, where are we? How many more questions? Uh, well, we're, I think we're at time. Um, <laughs> this has been wonderful. Um, so for those that there are more questions in the chat and uh, I want to read this chat and save it and read it more later. We will do about 15 minutes or so of updates from 350 Madison and then and Marie, if you want to rest with your with your camera off, it's okay. You've given us a lot of great things, um, and then we'll come back and um, we'll, we'll be here all the time. But we'll bring Maria back for a breakout discussion. You'll have a choice of three or four breakouts you can go to for those who can stay um, um, after the full meeting is over. Um, Gail, I think you're up next. Mm -hmm. to, to announce if I would be a good segue from Maria to talk about our somewhat new state policy group. Yeah, um, we're, um, we're really excited because of the governor's task force report and all the action going on at the state level right now. We are starting a state policy group as you uh, most of you probably know we have a really active community climate solutions team right now that focuses on local government and we've we felt it's time to really have a very organized and strategic approach to state government policy as well so we are starting a group it's only met once our second meeting is this wednesday at four o'clock. Uh, we're going to meet the first and third Wednesdays of the month from four to five. And this is a good opportunity if you're interested to really get in at the ground floor of our planning on this. At least tentatively, we're very interested in uh, state building code reform. And I'm sure a number of us will be asking Maria more questions about that in the breakout. 
But basically what we want to do is strategically select areas of state government policy where there would be a substantial impact on climate change and where our presence will add value. So that's what we're focusing on now. And if you're interested in getting involved, put your uh, name and email in the chat or email me directly and we'll get you on the mailing list. Oops. I didn't mean to advance, but I, you were almost done. Yeah. <laughs> I hit the wrong, the wrong um, thing, but um, thank you, Gail. And that was a great segue because there are a lot of exciting things happening um, in the state. And um, I'm so busy moving on. Could everyone just thank Maria for, for giving us so much of her time and, and all that work she's been done on this report. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> no, no. Um, now, we always like to do a little bit of action because we're, we're an action group, 350 Climate Action Team. Seth, can you tell us what action you want us to take tonight? I'd love to, Julia. And I'm glad we took a chance to um, thank Maria. Uh, I think that was very well deserved and a really good thing to do. Uh, certainly echo those, those, those sentiments. Um, so my name is Seth Jensen. I help coordinate 350 Madison's defund climate change work. And if you're familiar with us, you probably know us as the team that's often getting people to go and demonstrate outside of a local Chase Bank branch in order to send a message all the way to their CEO that we want him to go from being the head of the worst funder of climate change to not loaning money to any fossil fuel companies whatsoever. And we made a, few, a little bit of progress with that last year. And I'm just gonna um, say a little bit about that before we go into our action step. Um, it's not widely well known, but we also do engage in state level advocacy. And so we had an example of that back in 2020, just to give a little bit of the context, one of the reasons, one of the big obstacles for a lot of Wall Street banks to defunding climate change and yeah, to defunding climate change is the fact that on a lot of their boards, there are fossil fuel interests represented. And so Chase has had one of the worst examples of this. The head of their board used to be a man named Lee Raymond who is a ex, former Exxon executive. He's actually the architect of a lot of very damaging disinformation campaigns around fossil fuels, not someone who's at all going to be an ally to the cause of defunding fossil fuels and defunding climate change. So um, the folks who are kind of spearheading the chase campaign were thinking like, what can we do about this? And they were looking at the fact that most states, if not all states, have some degree of uh, investment in Chase Bank. And so what that means is that their state treasurers are shareholders in the bank. And of course, shareholders have the opportunity to sort of set the course in the direction of companies, especially at the annual shareholders meeting. So at the last Chase Bank annual shareholders meeting, there was a resolution to get Lee Raymond off the board of directors of Chase Bank. And there was a call put out for shareholders to vote for it. And so a few members of 350 Madison worked really, really hard to put together a request to our Wisconsin state treasurer, Sarah Godlewski, uh, also shareholder in Chase Bank by virtue of her position to vote for this resolution and she did it. So maybe we could just take a round of applause for that. Um, and now I'm going to invite you to show your support for Sarah directly. We put together what's basically like a digital thank you note. And I believe the, a link to that note is going into the chat soon if it's not already there. And by clicking on this link, you'll have an opportunity to sign the thank you note. Let Sarah Godlewski know that we really applaud this action. 
um, and support her choice to speak out for the climate. That is pretty much it. Um, so I, is a link in the chat, Julia? I can only see the link if I take down the slide. Um, oh, I see yeah. that it is. There it is. So everyone, click on that link even while you're on Zoom. Oh, nine people have signed in the last eight minutes. Ooh, I'm gonna add my name. So we'd really, this is a little bit sort of like a petition. We'd really like to get a lot of signatures. Well, we have a goal of three, 350, 350 signatures. Um, and we could get really close to a third of that way to the goal if folks sign today. Um, I'll just mention one thing. This, you may kind of recognize this action because we ran it before, but we had some technical issues, difficulties. So that's why we're rerunning it again. So if you've already, if you think you've already done this, you probably have, and we have your signatures on record. So you could do it again. And it's not like you're signing it twice tonight. Um, and if you do, we just, we won't add your signature from the previous activity that had some technical glitches. But anyway, so that's just a roundabout way of saying, really invite you to take a minute and sign the thank you note to Sarah Godlewski. And we're really looking forward to being able to like sign a lot more of these types of thank you notes um, as we anticipate many elected officials taking strong and bold steps for the climate. Seth, we're just gonna wait to give people a minute so they don't have to listen and act at the same time. We'll just wait. Yeah. I, uh, it said I signed, but it's not showing my name or registering me. Is that okay? Is, is it working? I think it probably is. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. And you can... Um... If you haven't found it, it, it is in the chat. You just click on that and it really does take very short time. I'm going to move on to call, that was the Divest and Defund team. And actually Seth will be leading a breakout for those that stay and aren't gonna talk to the, aren't in the newcomers breakout and not talking to um, Maria. Seth will talk a little bit more about our Divest and Defund. So you'll have lots of difficult choices. Um, um, Marion, I'm calling on you, aren't I? Marion? Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. This is Marion. I'm the um, co co lead, co chair of the uh, new climate justice team. And we just want to take a minute to just uh, celebrate that um, our team has consulted with uh, Justified Anger, which is a program uh, associated with the Nehemiah Center in town. It's a Black-led organization. Um, and we consulted with them about our work um, on behalf of climate justice. And they recommended a specific uh, action that we take, which is to, as a group, attend their African-American history class in town. So we are going to be doing that um, starting this week for the next nine weeks. It's a big effort, it's a big project. We're very proud of our people, we're very pleased. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're doing this and we will be uh, making a report about it um, at, at a later time. Um, I also want to just let everybody know that um, our climate justice team 
um, is forming and becoming more um, connected with each other and coming up with our, our work for the next period of time. And, um, and that meeting is coming up. And if I could have the next slide, it's going to be the 15th of February at seven o'clock. And if you're interested at all, uh, contact either myself or Tannis Matisson. Both of our um, emails are listed on the slide here or put a request in the chat. We'll um, get in touch with you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Marion. I now our last set of announcements, Kermit from our community climate solution team. Kermit. Hello, thanks. Uh, my name is Kermit Hovey and among other things, I am co-lead of the uh, Community Climate Solutions team. And I'm sharing this slide as uh, kind of an intro to the next more detailed announcement, but basically eternal vigilance oh. is indeed the price of democracy, even if Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin didn't say so. And so, the reason I, I highlight that is because you may or may not know that there are elections coming up already this year and this month even. And as we have noted here in the slide, democracy just does, doesn't just happen every four years. So one of Community Climate Solutions team's uh, focuses is on the fact that we need to think globally and act locally, and act locally daily, and even electorally. So there are statewide primaries coming up February 16th, and there are general elections coming up April 6th. You can find out details about what particular races are on your particular ballot, how to get absentee ballots, and all the other good stuff at myvote.wi.gov. And in addition, for Madison residents, we want to highlight the fact that a number of alder slots are up for grabs and there will be uh, alder candidate debates. Uh, actually, WRT has conducted a number of them already and there are more coming up. And so if you want to get some insight into where your alder candidates are in terms of climate change and climate change action, you can go to the link for the WRT candidate guide spring 2021 election. Uh, and also among the races in play is the superintendent of public instruction. And while people may tend to wonder why do we care about that, that's not climate change, is it? I'll point out the simple fact that Tony Evers, our current governor, who is with our encouragement and applause, uh, proving to be a climate change champion, started out in that humble but lovable role. And so we want to make sure that people who get into lower levels of government are moving in the right direction on all kinds of issues, including climate change. So if you want to find out more about the candidates, uh, there is a recording linked on that page with a link on that page of a uh, symposium or virtual forum that was held earlier in January. And an additional thing, want to just put in a plug for Transit Equity Day that is coming up, uh, let me see, well, February 4th. And as you may or may not know, uh, 350 Madison is a co-sponsor of that national event. It commemorates the uh, birthday of Rosa Parks, who you mostly probably are familiar with from her role as an iconic figure of the civil rights era, who chose the tactic of refusing to give up her seat on the bus to demand an end to segregation. So this is just a sample slide of the social media campaign that they are organizing and that we are participating in. Uh, it's essential to cut our greenhouse gas emissions and convert our economy to renewable non-emitting energy sources. How does that connect with transit? 
buses, more buses, fewer cars, and more electric buses, even better. So if you want to find out more about this event and the activities and ways you can participate, there's a bit.ly link on this slide. And uh, it's, also it's, been put, it's also been put into the chat. So right. thank you very much for your attention to these ideas. Again, we want to think, think globally and act locally. And if you want to join with us, the Community Climate Solutions team, we have our regular monthly meeting coming up. Sorry. On the third Thursday. It's supposed to say five. Sorry, I fixed oh, sorry, it. Five. Yeah. And somehow it got changed. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think we both changed it and somehow it changed back anyways. So gremlins, but five to six is indeed the time. And uh, please contact our co CCSD co-lead Susan Millar if you want uh, details about links and agenda. Uh, so thanks again. And I'll let community actions team or Julia take the next step. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Kermit. Well, we're wrapping up. I just want to let you know that, as you've probably figured out, those of you who are new to, to our group, we do everything by teams. And so you've seen our great Facebook posts or our, found us through web, the web page and all. Our community action team um, does that. And they um, would also welcome you, even if you're brand new um, or if you're not brand new. Um, that's Emily Park. Um, address to get on that mailing list. Um, there we go. Um, Seth, you met, who leads the Divest and Defund team. They're having a meeting, um, you know, in five minutes, um, but they also meet the fourth Mondays. So that would be February 22nd to plan actions to get Chase Bank to stop funding pipelines and fossil fuels. You haven't heard directly from the Tar Sands team, Although I think that question about line five came from the Tar Sands team. They're working very hard to halt plans for line 66 and the reroute of line five. And they meet the first Monday. So their next meeting is March 1st. And Phyllis Hasbrook would be happy to add you to the mailing list. 